Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to a special edition of At Issue, Your Vote, Your Voice. Across the nation, there are pending changes to the way people vote. Hundreds of voting bills are before Congress, some of which advocates are calling a threat to democracy. In nearby Georgia, Republican lawmakers have already adopted new restrictions on voting. Unlike many other state legislatures, Mississippi lawmakers did not pass measures restricting voter access during the 2021 legislative session. However, they also did not pass any bills expanding access to the ballot box. In tonight's special, we take a closer look at voting in Mississippi, modern day challenges facing the state and how these issues impact you. In the 2020 general election, a total of 1.3 million votes were cast in Mississippi. Of those ballots, more than 231,000 were submitted by absentee. That's slightly more than one out of every six votes, and it's a new record in this state. Throughout the coronavirus pandemic, states are continuing to examine election procedures and search for ways to make it safer and easier to vote absentee. But in Mississippi, voting by absentee ballot remains limited. Mississippi has in-person and mail-in absentee voting options, but to qualify, a voter must demonstrate a need to vote absentee. It has to be based on age, temporary or permanent physical disability, work demands, or being out of town on election day for any reason. That may include temporary relocation for educational purposes, living overseas, or serving in the armed forces. Mississippi is one of seven states where people cannot vote early by mail or in person without an excuse. Earlier this month, on the final day of the 2021 session, a small group of voting rights advocates rallied outside the Secretary of State's office after filing a ballot initiative to establish early voting in Mississippi. While it's not yet an official ballot initiative, supporters of the measure say it's already received an official review, guidance and certification from the Attorney General's office. Kelly Jacobs with the Mississippi Early Voting Initiative Coalition says she worked with Democratic Representative Hester McRae of DeSoto County to draft the initiative language. Well, in DeSoto County, we have 122,000 registered voters. On Election Day, November 3rd, our circuit clerk had 14,000 absentee ballots cast. 14,000 absentee ballots. It was an enormous amount of work for them to uh, notarize most of them, stick them in the envelope, and then categorize them by uh, which voting precinct they go to. And then it took the poll workers more than 24 hours to count them. They were not allowed to count them until starting after 7 p.m. on election day. And, who, and these poll workers went to work at seven o'clock in the morning. So they were actually asked to stay awake all that time, all day to open the envelopes and then after 7 p.m. to start counting them. It was a huge burden, but meanwhile, out on election day, there were lines, very, very long lines of people who wanted to vote because they don't trust the absentee voting system or they just don't qualify for it. Early voting lets anybody, any age who's a registered voter, to vote on one of 11 days, right? The 10 early voting days and then on election day because everybody doesn't have Tuesday off to go vote. Republican leadership has expressed reluctance or outright refusal to adopt early voting in Mississippi. Before last year's election, Governor Tate Reeves reiterated his position that voting should occur in person and on election day with few exceptions. But some members of the Republican Party say they do recognize growing public support for more voting options. Representative Kent McCarty of Hattiesburg co-authored a bipartisan bill that would have expanded early in-person absentee voting. It died in committee during this past legislative session. You know, if you look at in the legislature, um, this legislation, similar to what we're talking about, has passed the House twice. And it was before I got there, but it passed overwhelmingly, I believe, in 16 and 17. Um, so it's, it hasn't always been partisan like this. And I know a lot of it is because people are concerned about the security of elections, which we are, too. I mean, that's a huge problem, and that's something we want to make sure that we, you know, we keep elections secure while allowing for more opportunities to vote. Um, so, you know, I think I, I would I would love to see it return to that common sense, practical. Okay, if if voting with an ID on election day is secure, then voting with an ID the day before election day is secure. <laughs> and I think that's what everybody we need to get back to that. Um, and I think the voters are with us on that. Throughout American history, the right to vote and barriers to voting have been contentious issues. Aside from voting rights secured through 
constitutional amendments, the federal government has little power over elections. The power to manage and administer elections belongs to the states, where advocates say some barriers can still be found. To examine modern-day challenges facing communities that have been historically excluded from the ballot is Nishambi Lambright, executive director of One Voice, a nonprofit civic, civic engagement organization. So many people in Mississippi died um, just fighting for the right to cast a ballot. And we went through the whole Jim Crow period where individuals had to pay a poll tax or take um, ridiculous literacy exams to gain um, that right to vote. And so when we um, finally got the right to vote through the Voting Rights Act, um, you know, we were able to start seeing um, some of those victories um, in our communities. We started seeing more elected officials um, who look like us and who were able to uh, represent some of the needs um, and interests of the African American community. But we also had um, a state constitution um, in the late 1800s that um, knew that if former slaves were able to vote, that it could change some of the political tra um, trajectory in Mississippi. So in our state's constitution, um, it was listed that um, individuals who were convicted of certain crimes, and these crimes were identified as crimes that former slaves would probably commit, that these folks um, should be excluded from um, the voting rolls. And that law still exists today and we're still fighting <laughs> that law today, as well as a very antiquated um, voting system. Mississippi's um, absentee voting process uh, requires that you, know, you get a, um, a, an application notarized as well as the ballot notarized, um, which is, you know, provides a huge burden on individuals, especially elderly folks and college students. And, um, other provisions like not being able to register to vote online and, you know, just not having an early voting system here in Mississippi. There's so much that we have to catch up with the rest of the world on. Election security is often cited in arguments against mail-in voting or early voting, yet the 2020 general election was the most secure on record, according to election officials. Christy Wheeler, co-president of the League of Women Voters of Mississippi, says there is a line between safeguards and barriers in the election process, but it can be hard to define. Part of it is based on this misconception, untruth, <laughs> uh, that that mail-in voting is, is somehow um, open to fraud. And yet there is no documentation that that is the case. So trying to find the way that we can protect voters, we have to identify what are real problems and what are not real problems. And the, the fraud issue is not a real problem. In very close elections, one or two votes can make a difference. And that's the kind of fraud that they found in the state of Mississippi, onesies and twosies. Not anything that would determine a general election for um, state or public office, or presidential office, federal office. So trying to get away from those or trying to identify what's really a problem and what is created to be a false problem that we spend a lot of time chasing our tail on, I think is the most important thing to find that balance. I think that we've got good systems in place to protect the security of our elections. We don't need more restrictions. We don't need more um, laws that um, would throw people off the voter rolls. And, and that, that's an issue in Mississippi. So it's a, a, a falsehood that we're trying to defend to try to um, protect the voter base the way it is. And it's just not right. We should all want to have the greatest possible access for the most people to be able to go to the polls. That's what democracy is really about. Not shutting it down, not closing it off, opening it up to everyone. 
For those leaving prison, the weight of a felony conviction can also impede the ability to participate in the democratic process. Certain crimes carry disenfranchisement penalties, but other obstacles can also hinder ex-inmates when it comes to voting. Pauline Rogers is president and co-founder of the REACH Foundation, an organization aimed at helping individuals and families impacted by incarceration. She says the requirements to register to vote are often barriers for those trying to re-enter their communities. It can be housing. Some of them don't have stable, you have to have an address. Some of the barriers that some of them face would also be identification, where they may not have their license or a proper ID in order to go vote. And some of those people that get out of prisons here in Mississippi are not all from Mississippi, but caught their case while in Mississippi. And unless they have all of their documents to make them be a citizen in the state of Mississippi, that's a barrier, even if they are eligible to vote once they get out. Mississippi lawmakers will be working this year to redraw a number of maps that will impact voters. 2020 was a census year, which means the U.S. Congress will reapportion its representation in the House of Representatives. On the state level, census data will also be used to draw Mississippi's House and Senate districts for the next legislative elections in 2023. Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman explains the redistricting process with MPB's Karen Brown. We were supposed to get the information on our decennial census last year by December. We are required to redistrict uh, our, our the state of Mississippi for its congressional districts beginning next congressional uh, elections, which will be that next March. They have to qualify by March, and then, of course, elections are runoffs and will be no November, the following November. So we have a time deadline. They postponed because of the pandemic. They postponed us to receiving the information in September the 30th of this year. So we will be on a very short time frame to redistrict the four congressional districts in Mississippi. That's the first thing that will happen. Shortly thereafter, during the legislative session, we will redistrict the members of the Senate and the House. So all of those redistricts will be done probably early next year. The, they, we do that so that people will know whether or not they want to run for a particular office. They'll know the district in which they live and which they would be seeking. When the census numbers come in, can they be interpreted? The numbers themselves, not necessarily where they come from, but the numbers themselves. There are, uh, we do pay attention in, in addition to the numbers to the uh, majority minority makeup, and you know, there have been several Supreme Court cases on that. So uh, we do pay attention to that aspect uh, that's given to us by the census, but very little other, no economic decisions, no anything like that. Uh, clearly those are just left up to the committee to come up with. But one thing they do pay attention to, of course, is the majority minority uh, participation in each district. Now, I know that there's electoral competitiveness or gerrymandering that runs along political lines. With Mississippi being overwhelmingly Republican, is it safe to assume that the lines will be drawn to favor Republican candidates? No. Do you want to add on to that? I don't think I need to add on to it. Uh, we in the Senate, as you can see, the, uh, the makeup of this committee is bipartisan. And we, in, we intend to t anticipate looking at districts which are geographical in location, who make common sense for cities and counties where we don't have a lot of split precincts. I, I was a former Secretary of State here. Split precincts just drive everybody crazy, the circuit clerks and the voter. So we don't want split precincts. And, and so we're, there'll be a lot of things that, that are taken into account. But uh, we're redistricting Mississippi on, on the needs, economic needs, the normal political uh, 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 parts, the cities and the counties, and, and trying to maintain their integrity and not split up like five, five representatives for one city. What that ends up having is you don't have any representation. So, no, I, I think our major concerns will be the voter. 
The redrawing of district maps comes with inherent biases and complications, says Democratic Representative Ed Blackman of Canton. He is serving his 39th year in the state legislature, dedicating a number of those years to working on redistricting efforts. Representative Blackman says a key priority for many lawmakers is keeping the district that elected them. He talks more about the politics of redistricting with at issue producer Ashley Norwood. You mentioned issues, problems uh, that may arise in a process of redistricting. Can you explain that? Well, because uh, politicians, elected officials involved, involved, are involved in the process. And just like in the in insect population, the bacteria population, the human population, uh, survival is what it's all about. And in the redistricting process, the best district that you have is the one you just got elected from. And most politicians are trying to, when it comes to redistricting every 10 years, you're trying to make sure that you have as close as you can to uh, your chances, uh, in, well, increasing your chances of being reelected. So it comes, that becomes the issue. And every redistricting uh, scheme, uh, very few politicians want to give up the core of their district, even though, they, or even though uh, the population may have dramatically increased or uh, been reduced. So you have terms such as gerrymandering, and most people don't understand what that is. Uh, but you, you know it, it's like, like uh, one Supreme Court justice said about uh, pornography. You know it when you see it. And uh, that goes on a lot. In, in, in the Mississippi, we have a really serious problem, especially at the, at the state level because we have our, the minority districts or the African-American districts are packed. The white districts are packed with like-minded, like-raced people in them. And so you have, uh, at the state level, you have uh, uh, about 50, 51 African-Americans in the legislature, but we're all packed in the districts about 70 plus, most of them are 70 plus percent of the African-American uh, majority uh, districts. Uh, and that's fine when it comes to equalizing population, but it, it, it kind of skews uh, what we do at the, uh, for, from a policy standpoint. It's based on, in Mississippi, unfortunately, it's, um, if you're black, you tend to be a Democrat. If you're white, at least in the, from an electoral standpoint, you tend to be, uh, Republicans tend to be white. So uh, we have that issue coming up in the next uh, redistricting process. It's always been a problem in Mississippi for as long as I've been involved in it. So let's get straight to the point now with views from both sides of the aisle. Brandon Jones is an attorney and former Democratic member of the House. Austin Barber is a national Republican strategist and founder of the Clearwater Group. Gentlemen, thanks for being here for this special edition of uh, At Issue. Let me start with a fairly general question. Um, I think a lot of folks would assume that most Republicans, really starting with Donald Trump and his allegations about the 2020 election, uh, are in, in favor of election reform, reform and most Democrats are, are against it. Is that a fair statement, Austin? No, not at all. I think both sides want election reform and both sides want election reform in their own ways that they think are important for election reform. When I look at election reform in Mississippi, when I look at ways, and I've been doing politics and campaigns since I was a little boy, here's what I would do. If I was in the legislature, if I was a decision maker, I would. Th these are the things that I think need to be done to improve voting. We all went and voted in 2020, and we all stood in really long lines. There was, there was, um, there were a lot of people. There was a lot of excitement about whether you wanted to vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden or somebody else. You you want to know how you fix this? You hire more people. You hire more poll workers first and foremost. You pay them more than the $75, $80, $90 that they get paid to be there all day. And let's find buildings that actually work. Let's get these things, let's get our polling places out of fire stations, put them in large facilities so we have more room. I wouldn't have had to stand in the line for an hour at the elementary school down from my house if it was in a facility that was actually bigger, if they had more people. If we improve the mechanics, of how we actually run elections in Mississippi, the election day process will be much smoother for voters. Brandon, most Democrats uh, in favor of widespread election reform? 
Yeah, I mean, in Mississippi, Wilson, we have the most restrictive voting laws in the entire country. It, it's harder to cast an absentee voter uh, ballot in Mississippi than it is anywhere else in the United States. You heard a moment ago, Nishambi Lambright detailing what it takes. You have to get the application notarized. Then you have to get the actual ballot notarized. Now imagine being a college student, first time out of, out of home, 19 years old in a new community, trying to find two notaries in the middle of a pandemic. It's not easy, and, and we're unusual in that respect. But I'll say this now, Austin just mentioned some things that he would find Democrats agree with him on at that legislature. Putting more money into our, into our voting is absolutely necessary. Better training is necessary. Uh, having good, accessible places to vote is a good idea. Yeah. And to make it community-based, because obviously you you want everybody to have that equal access. So, so to answer your question, yes, Wilson, we've got a long way to go in Mississippi. I will say, Austin, though, I'm glad that this year we didn't make it harder to vote. Yeah, and I, and I will say, I actually wrote this down and I forgot to say it. I do agree there are some aspects of absentee balloting that we must improve as well. So look, there are ways that we can fix and improve voting in Mississippi without doing early voting. And I know we'll talk about this in a minute, but obviously, I am very much opposed to that, and we'll discuss that when you're ready to prompt us for that. Well, I, I'm ready now because you talked about the long lines in the polls, and part of that was because of COVID and the and the um, the social distancing that had to be practiced. But there were a lot of people at the polls. Would not early voting eliminate some of that? Yeah, if you look at stats across the country, the answer to that is no. Um, I, I, I wrote this quote down from Mrs. Wheeler, who was with the League of Women Voters, and she seems like a great woman. I've never met her personally. I know she 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 means this, and she said we should all want the great you know the greatest access for all people to vote, and early voting will ensure this. Well, I do agree. I want as many people to vote as they possibly can, but early voting does not necessarily equate to more people. Go listen to Bill Gardner, who testified in, in front of Congress about H.R. 1, which is being discussed um, uh, at, at, in Congress right now. Um, he is the Democrat longest-serving Secretary of State in, in the United States history, and he's from New Hampshire. And what he has said is New Hampshire has no early voting. They require voter ID. They do allow for same-day uh, voter registration. They have some absentee balloting. They are in the top five of turnout every single year. If you look at California, this is the model for, Matt, for Nancy Pelosi. California, four of the last five elections, they were 46, 49th, 49th, and 43rd. Mississippi had greater turnout than California in 2016 and 2012. One more state, Oregon, because we're looking at facts here. In 1996, Oregon changed to an all mail-in voting. Uh, in, the, in the Wall Street Journal this morning, Bill Gardner, Secretary of State of New Hampshire, said the Oregon Secretary of State said, hey, come with us. Let's do this. I don't want to do that, the guy from New Hampshire said. And Oregon has never had a higher voter turnout than New Hampshire. And New Hampshire, if, if you're asking Democrats in Congress, have these just uh, crazy uh, restrictive uh, you know, voting access, but they're leading the, they're, they're top five every time. So I do not think things change in elections. We've all done campaigns. Early voting is a voter incumbent protection tool. It is so hard when you're doing a campaign. I am dispassionately against this. We've all seen things happen in the last 10 days. I've talked too much, Brandon. <laughs> I'll be quiet now, but I'm if very you, passionate about If you this. could get Republicans in Mississippi to give us New Hampshire's voting laws right now, we'll take them. They have no excuse absentee voting. That changes everything, Austin. If you can vote absentee without having to prove that you're physically disabled, without having to prove that you're impaired or that you're going to be out of state during the election, then that's a game changer. Yeah. And so there are things that states, you could mention any state in the world, and I think you just did, <laughs> and it would still be better voting laws than what we have in Mississippi. And Christy Wheeler was right. You, you want to make this process as accessible and available as humanly possible. Early voting is, is absolutely a way to do that. In 2010, there was a select committee of House members and Senate members who went across the state with Secretary Hoseman, who was then our Secretary of State, and who listened to voters in every part of this state. There was not a single one of those hearings where someone did not say how much easier it would be if our election day was a holiday, or if we were able to go and vote earlier on a Saturday, or on a day when I didn't have to be at work. And so, uh, in fact, the smart barber 
Haley Barber said early voting made good sense. It was Delbert Hoseman who kind of stood in the way of early voting when we passed voter ID at the legislature. So I, look, but Austin, I think what I hope you hear me saying, what I hope we hear some of these advocacy groups saying is, it's not one thing in particular, it's just don't make it restrictive. Like we know we have an onerous absentee val balloting process, let's make it easier for Mississippians. Let's make sure we're having our polls open for a good amount of time. Let's make sure our people who are doing our polling are educated and know how to administer it. Let's just make it as easy as we can. Well, you, you and I have said things right here where we could get on the same page to, right. to do what you've said. Um, but listen, we both have done campaigns before. We both know things change the last week or in some states the last six weeks. Some states it's 45 days out when you can start voting. Things change, man. Yeah. That worries me. It worries you that maybe someone who's already sealed in their ballot days in advance suddenly learns something about the other candidate yeah. and wishes, and it's too late yeah. to, to, the, to go the other way. There are all, there's all kinds of things that have happened in, in presidential history. But I'll say that's kind of a campaign concern, Austin. I would say the constitutional right to participation outweighs that kind of very narrow campaign concern. It's, I don't disagree with you, but that, you know, and look, we have that right in states that have early voting. You can always wait and be an election day voter. Last point. The, let's make that constitutional right easier on election day, not before. I'm for making it easier anytime. You get your boys to come along, we're there. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you. We are out of time. Don't forget you can watch this program online or listen to the podcast at mpbonline.org. Thank you for joining us on At Issue. Good night. This program is a partnership with the Mississippi Humanities Council and the Federation of State Humanities Councils, funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation.